Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'll start at 11.50, and our last panelist has just arrived. Um, just to make sure that everyone's in the same room, because if you're like me this week, I've been in many rooms that I shouldn't be at, because I, my Roman numerals aren't that good. So this session now is on the, how can we limit the negative impact of Caragrade, NATS, technology, and boost IPv6 adoption. I don't know how many people in the room actually know what a grade NAT is, but don't worry about it. In 90 minutes' time, you will know everything there is to know about a grade NAT. And you could probably tell us a bit more about it as well. Um, I'm just filling in time because I'm not sure if the presentations are all loaded. Okay. Well, my name's uh, Dick Leaning. I'm from Ripe NCC, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, um, RIPE NCC is one of the regional internet registries and we administer IP addresses around 76 countries. Um, I won't go through introduction of all the panellists now, I'll do it as and when they speak. And the issue today is basically, as we all know, to get onto the internet you need an IP address. If you don't have your own IP address, you have to share an IP address. And with everyone having three or four of these things in their pockets, in their bags, we're running out of IP addresses that each one can have, so there's more and more sharing going on. That's very simplistic, and as we go into the detail, <laughs> I'm seeing some of my community going, uh, as we go into the more detail, will come a bit more of this, but that is basically the problem that we're having at the moment, there isn't enough IPv4 addresses to go around, so we are sharing. And the challenges of that sharing hits um, businesses, networks, law enforcement who are trying to look after the public, etc., etc. So hopefully, in the end of this 90 minutes, we'll have a clear review of what the challenges are and how we can move forward. So the first person I hope is ready is Ron. Ron De Silva down on my left there, he's an, exec an executive leader, technology expert, and he's well known in this community. He's a CEO of the Network Technologies Global, and he's also a member of the ICANN board. Ron? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to borrow something I saw Niels Tenover do earlier in the week and ask everybody first, raise your hands. No, everybody, just raise your hands. This is a forced exercise, I think. So now, if you know what CGN is, Lower your hand. Uh, okay, now how about IPv6? No, no, uh, lower. So, okay, this was a test to see how many in the audience are here with us that have no idea what CGN is. And, and a little bit about whether or not IPv6 is familiar. Um, and that's important because my task in kicking off the panel is to provide a bit of a foundation on what is CGN. First of all, it's an acronym, so I'll have to explain that. But what is CGN and why is it important? Why are we talking about it? So that's, that's what I'm going to achieve and then hand it over to uh, the rest of the panelists to then get into a bit more detail on, on issues related to CGN. So next slide, please. Maybe. We can change it on the fly. Good. Thank you. It's important to note that for every device to communicate on the internet, it needs to have a unique address. And this is important. Think of it as if your postal address, you um, share the same address as, I don't know, your friend's cousin who lives in uh, Kenya, and, uh, and you happen to reside in, say, Indonesia, and you're looking for you know, a gift to come for your birthday, and half the year, you know, some, on the even years it goes to Kenya, the odd years it actually shows up at your house. So you get your gift every other year. Well, if you um, have a unique address, then you don't have this issue of your birthday gift showing up at somebody else's house every other year. The same is true on the internet. If you, if you share an address, if your address is not unique, then it's unclear for the rest of the internet where to send your Skype message, your email, your web browser content, all these things. It's important that every device is uniquely identified so that it can communicate with every other device on the internet. Now, service providers are in the business of providing connectivity. An important thing for a service provider in order to sell and to provide access to the internet is to have a pool of addresses that they can assign to their customers as those customers come 
onto the internet using their network. Next slide. The way service providers obtain these unique addresses in order to allocate them to their consumers or businesses that are customers of the service providers, and similarly, even enterprises that are on the, on the internet, you know, they need addresses to, to uniquely identify every server, every device, every uh, router, every switch, every phone, every IoT device that is providing surveillance and, and uh, monitoring and all kinds of capability. Everything needs a unique address. So these addresses are managed through a regional internet registry system. This beautiful map that shows these different colors for regions indicates how that is coordinated across the globe. There are five different organizations called regional internet registries that have these large pool, pools of addresses that operators in these regions can go to and obtain those necessary addresses required for providing access to the internet to their customers. Uh, generally, um, these uh, addresses, uh, there are, and let me talk about uh, versioning for a second. The internet was, was established with uh, initial inter internet protocol version number four. Internet protocol version number four, or IPv4, had four billion addresses defined. And early in the internet development, it was believed that would be plenty of addresses for the foreseeable future. Well, we are in the foreseeable future, and four billion, if you can think about, take half the world population, everybody with a mobile phone, you're already there. And if everybody has, besides a mobile phone, maybe a laptop, maybe um, uh, some other devices in your home, suddenly you can see 4 billion is way under uh, resource for the needs of connecting the entire world to this thing called the internet. So we are running out. Uh, early on, uh, some early adapters had gotten huge uh, tranches of addresses before this coordinated registry system was established. Uh, but since it was established in the 90s, uh, it's been fairly uh, well established on policies regarding need. Uh, a service provider who can demonstrate they have a forecast for some number of customers can come to the registries and indicate, I need addresses, here's my marketing forecast, here's my sales forecast, here's how I can justify the need to have all these addresses. Uh, but more on the earlier allocations that predated the registry systems a bit later in the slides. Next slide, please. So how many are there? I, I mentioned in the, the, the current protocol version number four, uh, the, the initial version, there are four billion of these. In 99, a new version was established and adopted by the industry called Internet Protocol version six. Yes, it skipped five uh, by design. And uh, it provides quite a bit more addresses, uh, 4 billion times 4 billion times 4 billion times 4 billion or um, a pile of addresses. Now this is also perceived to be plenty for the foreseeable future. And uh, if we can simply address all these unique devices coming onto the internet with one of these new IPv6 addresses, then we have what we need, which is uniqueness for any device. The problem is one of migration. Any device that is using the old protocol cannot communicate with a device using the new protocol. They are incompatible. And that means until the entire internet is using IPv6, then it's necessary to still have IPv4 addresses so that you can communicate with other devices that are still using IPv4. Next slide. So a common strategy that operators are using in order to make this transition work is threefold. One, run everything in both addresses, use IPv4 and IPv6 until there is enough of the internet using IPv6, then IPv4 can be deprecated. We are not there, we're not even close to being there. So right now, every operator who is implementing a migration strategy is obtaining uh, IPv6 addresses and numbering or addressing all of their customers and all their equipment with both addresses. And then it's very important if, if a service provider was selling internet access today and, and only had IPv6, because the entire internet is not using IPv6 yet, it would be a competitively disadvantaged service. Because as a consumer or as a business, if I was 
uh, given only an IPv6 address, there's a, a, a very large portion of the internet that I would not be able to reach. Remember I said IPv4 and IPv6 are incompatible, so if I only have an IPv6 address, I can't communicate to the majority of the internet that is still using IPv4, and some of it IPv4 only. Thus, as an operator, not only do I want to number all of my devices into both addresses, but I also want to save and conserve the IPv4 addresses that I have in my, in my pocket. How can I, um, you know, delay my run out of IPv4 as long as possible so that I can continue to sell uh, a competitive product in the marketplace? So that's point number two. Point number three, advocate the rest of the industry to get there. How do we get the rest of the industry to have IPv6 deployed? Thus, the problem of incompatibility goes away. This is a common strategy you'll hear from a lot of operators how they're implementing IPv6. Now, what happens though for that operator when they run out of IPv4? If there is insufficient amount of the internet using IPv6 and they are still looking to expand and sell access and have no IPv4, there's a problem. There are several ways, at least a couple I'll talk about on how to address that. One is go to um, the market there is now established a mechanism where uh, a, an operator who has more addresses than they need or an entity that has larger pool of address space than um, they, they have a, 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 you know, a business need for anymore, they can sell it. They can sell it to other operators who need it. Remember I mentioned earlier on that before the coordinated registry systems existed, there were some early adopters in the internet who obtained large tranches of addresses. Well, now they can go and sell those to people who need them. So there's, there's this option, it costs. Uh, so an operator could look in the open market and find other entities who have large pools of IP, IPv4 addresses and acquire them through some sort of monetary exchange. And then secondly, this is the, this is the whole point of our topic this morning is they could share them in the same way in, uh, next slide, in the same way at home, you may have a router that uh, is connecting you to your access provider. The devices in the house all share what's called private addresses. These are addresses that are only used within your home and as they leave the house, as a web request comes from your browser over to Google for a search engine request of some sort, it gets translated from an internal private address to that unique address to then communicate with the rest of the internet. So it's shared. All your devices in the home may share a single IPv4 address and then reach the rest of the internet um, by using this translation on your router. And then coming back in, it, it, the router keeps state and it translates back to your private address. This works great uh, in your home. You see this also in hotels. When you're visiting a hotel that uh, the addresses are all shared and the hotel may use a pool of addresses um, Rather than give out addresses to uh, unique addresses to every device in the hotel, they share a pool and as your communications from your hotel room or the lobby go out to the rest of the internet, it gets translated. Well, operators are looking at those models and implementing that same strategy on a much larger scale. They call this carrier grade NAT, network address translation. So CGN, the acronym I asked in the front, is carrier grade NAT. These large appliances are being deployed uh, on a much broader scale to share a small pool of addresses with a very large population of customers. Thus, uh, as communications leave the service provider's network to the rest of the internet, they change the address, put a unique address on the outside, and then when it comes back into the network, they can readdress it back into the private address. Sounds great. Conservation at its best. Next slide, and this is my last. In general, service providers recognize that crime is bad for business. You find a lot of operators will co cooperate and coordinate with local, national, international law enforcement agents in order to make sure that if there's a crime happening on their network or transiting their network that they can in fact help and support the prosecution of that crime. Generally, crime is not good for business. And service, service providers recognize that and, and will be supportive of efforts to help combat crime. Now, what does this have to do with CGN? 
Well, the problem with CGN is now that you've got this device that's shared, historically, if there's a crime taking place where uh, a cr some criminal is leveraging access in a service provider's network to go across the internet and try to hack or otherwise compromise uh, a web server somewhere, the, the operator of the web service could contact their law enforcement and provide to them, this is the address that is attacking my servers. Uh, law enforcement can then go to the service provider who has that address and ask, who is the owner of this address? Well, that's easy if the address is from your house. A little less, it's also easy if it's an address from a, from a hotel. Then the hotel can try to identify where is this coming from inside. Or a conference like here. It gets a lot more difficult the larger the pool is that is sharing those addresses. So if you think about this appliance, this carrier grade NAT that is being deployed and providing a small pool of addresses across a very large population of internet users, then it becomes very complex for the law enforcement to then identify here is the address of the miscreant. Because that address is being shared. Who is it? It could be anybody, a, a whole number of different uh, folks on the service provider's network. So it's not so straightforward to say this address belongs to this particular customer and thus we can prosecute that particular endpoint. And thus, the point of our slide, the point of our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Yes, round of applause. That's the scene setting. I know it was a high level to let everyone know exactly what the issue is. And now we're going to go to uh, Jan George, who is a, one of the technical experts, renowned globally, set up many networks around, and now works for ISOC. And he's going to probably go into real techie stuff. So please hang on to your seats, listen. And if there's anyone that doesn't understand, Please make yourselves known and we can ask a few bit of questions as we go along because it's important that we all understand as we move along what it is that we're talking about. Yeah? Work. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Jan Georges and before they set my presentation on the screen, um, I work for Internet Society. I come from Slovenia and um, just as a, as a disclaimer, this presentation uh, that you will see, uh, it is much reduced from, from 30 slides down to 19, was done in 2010. It was used to make operators understand about the bad things that CGN will bring if they will uh, uh, implement it in their network and try to put people behind the shared addresses and doing it without deploying IPv6 uh, at the same time. Um, can, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a disclaimer. Uh, well, it was done in 2010. And these are my personal views that was done before I joined the Internet Society. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the CGN. I think Jason Fessler made this very nice picture of um, you see lots of people coming in and then you have the overloaded device that is, um, uh, th this is a stateful machine that needs to keep all the sessions. The more users you put behind the CGN, the more sessions needs to be um, uh, recorded and uh, maintained. And then you have one little um, uh, cable out that is, um, and as you, you can see, these things many times go to 100% and just doesn't work. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, bear in mind, this was done for operators to change their minds on the CGN. Um, good perspectives of the CGN. It delays a little bit the problem with the IPv4 space because we share the IPv4 addresses. Um, if we are blind enough, we can even not see all the consequences. And Network architects can get away easily with it because, um, you know, it solved the problem quickly. Uh, people know how, not, how net works, how translation works, and they can just easily implement it in their network and just move the problem to somebody else. You know, network architecture is all about moving the problems around the network, usually. Um, we can even persuade some people that uh, the network is more secure with CGN because we are doing the security by obscurity because we are hiding uh, people behind. 
and we close our users in the walled garden and keep them there forever. Next slide, please. Um, yes, this is bad. Some operators may even see this as the, the, the good thing because they close their users in the unchangeable application world, world garden where people can do only things that the operator um, uh, is prescribing them to do and letting them do. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, there is lots of misconceptions that NAT is a security mechanism. It is not. Firewall is a security mechanism. NAT is just a simple translation mechanism, right? It comes with the obscurity, but don't, don't get it as a, as a security mechanism. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, with the carrier grade NAT in the core, um, you trap a person with the unchanged application uh, policy. That means internet was done on innovation. So if, if I innovate a new protocol and I build the application that would communicate with, with the other host, in the open internet, I just share my application with you and our machines will start talking to each other and everything will be fine. If I'm behind the CGN, then all of a sudden, my, my application, my protocol cannot talk to you because there is a CGN in the middle. And can you imagine me calling my, my internet service provider, my, the telecom, and say, oh, can you please implement the application layer gateway and helper in your big CGN just for my specific protocol that I just invented? And they would just, just hang up the phone probably. It doesn't work. So you, you completely kill the innovation with the, with the carrier grade net. And this is the opposite of the end-to-end -end model of the internet that, that we all love and um, um, uh, embrace. Next slide, please. Internet was built and meant with the smart at the edge. Um, and as I explained, um, you can easily deploy new uh, application if you, have, if you have the smart edge and stupid core. But with the CGN, you are taking the smart in the core. And there is a very good presentation that is called the revenge of the smart core. And this is very telco thinking. It's not the internet thinking. It's the opposite of the, of the internet uh, thinking. Uh, next slide, please. And um, yeah, if, if we want some port forwarding and things like this, uh, the NAS are typically mitigated by offering the customers limited control over them. I cannot imagine that you would send from your home the, 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 the UPMP commands to the, to the carrier grade net of your provider and try to drill the holes and reserve some ports, no operator will let you do this. Uh, do this. Um, next slide, please. And we have a session state. Every CGN is a stateful machine. Internet was never meant to be stateful. Internet needs to be stateless. So we need to do the trade-off between the session state and the network placement. So if we place our CGN towards the, towards the edge of our network, then you get less state that you need to maintain. But then, um, you know, uh, then it's not so efficient as it should be. If you, if you put it towards the core of your network, then you need to maintain a huge number of, of states in your machine. This is costly. And it doesn't scale pr properly because when you, when you give more people on the, uh, behind the CGN, then you need to put a lot of money to make your CGN bigger and bigger. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, we covered that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the CGN. It's the IPv4 live support. <laughs> and we connect to it and we just keep it going and keep it going and until that little machine works, we are alive. That's what we do if we, if we implement without uh, CGN without IPv6. It just, it just doesn't work. Next slide, please. Okay. Here my question is, what is your exit strategy? You deploy a CGN, you share IPv4 space between uh, your users, but what is your exit strategy? Your user base is getting bigger and bigger, 
and you just need to maintain your, your CGN and, and scale it and put a lot of money in it. Do you see what's the problem on this picture? This guy, these guys parked the van and started implementing these poles around, but they didn't think of the exit strategy. <laughs> they didn't have much thinking implemented in this. So this is like when you implement CGN without IPv6. Next slide, please. The way out. Um, back in time, we uh, standardized the A, A, A plus P protocol. That's the A address plus port sharing mechanism. And we have, and that is basically based on IPv6. Um, then we have map E and map T as a stateless flavor of A, A plus P. These days we have 464XLAT is also a viable stateful solution. Um, and remember, if you, if you implement CGN, please implement it with IPv6. Because today, I, I travel a lot around the world, talk to operators, and they say when they deployed IPv6 and gave the IPv6 to their customers, half of the traffic instantly moved to IPv6 because Google, Facebook, and every big content operator is now going to v6. So you just move your traffic on IPv6 and just go end to end without any need of translation. And the rest of the traffic that needs to talk to IPv4, is, it's going to the translation box, but then the box is smaller. That means less money, and when you scale your, your um, uh, user base, you don't have to scale the whole traffic. If you're, if you're shipping out 100 gigs of traffic, it's much better to provide a translation just for 50 gigs of traffic, uh, for f uh, 500 gigs of traffic, and not for 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 uh, 100 gigs of traffic. Um, so it it works much better if you uh, deploy it. Next slide, please. Um, but you know, back in 2010, we figured out what. Europol is figuring out today, there is one small common problem with all address sharing solutions. Next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> IP address is not a unique identifier of a user anymore. And content providers must start logging source ports in their logs because, you know, there are, there are things that people will want to investigate online and if you can't provide who that user was behind that IP address, and if you say, oh, there was 60,000 users using that IP address at that point in time, then people cannot investigate it, and most probably you as an operator will be viable for that address, and somebody will sue you. If your user stole 10 million euros from the bank, the bank will sue you as the operator of the CGN because that IP address was configured on your device in your network. So. Um, Think about it. Next slide, please. Uh, and logging on the CGN and a port range router is a killer because you need to log everything. That is resource a hog. And um, this, is, this is all becoming a, a complete mess. Next slide, please. So the common suggestions is IPv6 and 464XLAT or NAT64 for mobile networks or IPv6 and map E and map T that is a stateless uh, A plus P solution based on IPv6 for fixed access networks. CGN as such without IPv6 has no exit strategy. Remember the van. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shen. Everyone keeping up? Good. Now, the uh, marquee panel presenter, well, my colleague from Europol, who has just run away. Don't run away. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Greg Munez from Europol, European Cybercrime Centre, based in The Hague, uh, head of outreach and strategy for the EC3. He's now going to talk about some of the challenges that law enforcement have with carrier grade NATs. Um, He's bravely stood up for this panel session because he's been a few others this week where he's been given a hard time, so please feel free to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be me sat there, so I'm quite happy now I'm sat here. So, Greg, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I see a number of you, Mike in particular, but you know, 
welcoming your our issue moves. But anyway, okay. So thanks very much for everyone to to set up um, the the baseline, and so now everyone knows everything about CGN and IPv6. So what I'll do very quickly is just to tell you uh, in more details the impact of Gary Great Nats and um, global IPv4 on criminal investigations online and the type of problems we get as law enforcement. Uh, we didn't um, uh, identify the problem last year, um, even today. I mean, we've identified the problem since 2011, in fact. Um, some of the EU member states, the, in particular Belgium, for instance, has already taken steps at the time in 2012, but it takes time to move things around. And we're happy to put it back on the agenda now. And uh, thanks for IGF as well to accept this, uh, this panel. So basically, next slide, please. If we, if we take a step back, when you do investigations online, whatever types of crime which is reported um, to, to the police, the first traces we will find at the, at the beginning of the investigations will be probably emails. So you, you have some information in your headers. You have connections to a website, a post on social media platforms and the rest. You can find nicknames. You can find um, whatever things. And then you ask for the log files on the attack computers, for instance. And then once you have this basic type of information, then you take a, text, uh, uh, um, a step further and you request for more information to the um, internet content providers, so the, the hosting platform, uh, the social media platform, and you will get the IP of connection plus potentially a, a timestamp. Then on the basis of that IP, you might be going to the right database and you find out that this IP, particular IP, belongs to a block of IP which belongs to let's say Orange, the uh, internet service providers in France. So you go back to Orange and you say, can you please uh, identify the subscriber that was using that IP address at that time connecting to Facebook, for instance. But the problem, and then once you have that information, then you can start doing normal traditional investigative method and, and um, interrogate people, do house searches and, and the rest. The problem, of course, with, next slide, please. With CGN, next slide again, because we've been through this and again. Yes, the impact, of course, is that once you make that request to Orange or to another in internet access <coughs> provider, if you have a global IPv4 address as your only um, link to the crime or to, to the, the perpetration, of, um, then they will come back with a list of potentially hundreds of potential users using the same IP because they can't discriminate between the users because you're not providing them with the right information. And because of CGN, which mutualize all the subscribers be behind one email address. So in most of the cases, they will say, well, police, I can't, I can't give you that list of 100 or 200 people because you potentially have one suspect and all the others are, uh, are, um, are innocent. Um, and so if you, are, if you are working on a case which is um, you know, fairly important and you might have uh, be a bit more persuasive, and then the, the provider will give you the list. That can also, also go up to the southern sometimes. So the problem is there is no possibility to attribute and to um, crime online on the basis of a global IP, and you can't trace back an individual based on an IP address. So that's really a, a massive problem. It's not only affecting um, uh, cyber, it's actually affecting any types of crime, because nowadays, even a murder, you might have some information um, on the mobile of the, the suspect which connected to the internet just before, and then you will need to know, because that's probably one of, of the only um, uh, clue that you have to link to, to, to a person. We had a number of cases like this. Uh, it's also a problem of non-compliance, because in most countries, at least in all the EU member states countries, you have domestic legislation saying that uh, an internet or any um, electronic um, service providers, uh, when it's served with a court order, um, needs to identify the users on, on, on any types of, um, of information you provide. So in France, for instance, you've got la loi du of the 21st of June. In the UK, you have the same. Uh, there is also references in the Budapest Convention. But because of that technology, because of that standard, CGN, electronic service providers can't comply with national legislation. Next slide, please. The scale of the problem. In 2016, we made a survey with all the EU member states cyber divisions. Everyone is affected. So some of the country with less severities, for instance in Belgium, because they managed to find um, um, a, a workaround system, but it affects every type of criminal investigations. So from terrorism, drug trafficking, uh, fraud, economic fraud, um, uh, cyber, any types of, of, of crime. There is also an academic research that was done in 2016 which showed that CGN are used by internet access providers in 95% of the, GS the mobile internet access. So think about it. Now everyone's using its mobile to connect to the internet. That means, in fact, that you don't, go you don't need to go to Tor to be anonymous online. 
if you use your mobile phone to connect to the internet with 3G or 4G, it's very, very difficult to identify somebody who does something wrong on the internet. And 50% of the traditional fixed line internet access are also going to use um, CGN. So conclusion, CGN is a major problem for criminal investigation online, and the problem is growing. Next slide, please. There is a, a simple way of um, um, identifying an end user behind a CGN, and that was documented by the Internet Engineering Task Force in 2011. So the content providers or the websites on which uh, somebody connects to uh, should log the source port number. So that's what uh, Jan was, was saying. But they don't really do it because they've got no obligation to do it. So at the end, when you make a request as a law enforcement person, you won't get the, 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 the source port number. Next slide, please. So that's just a case example which was given to me last year by the French police. Um, it's uh, natuxo.com is a French-speaking ad website for hunting gear. So if you are into hunting and you, you want to sell your old rifle, you go on that website, you post, a, you post a, a, an ad, and then somebody will buy it from you. Um, one day, somebody reports to the police that someone is trying to sell an AK-47 assault rifle. This is illegal in France, in pretty much all the member states in, in the EU. So. Um, the police will go and they make a request for the IP logs to um, uh, natuxo.com. They provide the logs. You get an IP address. It um, resorts to a, um, uh, a Swiss uh, internet mobile provider. We make a request to the Swiss colleagues, and the Swiss colleague, on the basis of the IP address, the Swiss colleague go and see uh, Swisscom, Swiss Telecom. And then the Swiss says, well, if you don't give me the source port number, I can't give you the, 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 I can't identify the subscriber. So in that case, we close the case. Why? Because it's just, you know, the, the ad was uh, taken down quickly, and at the end, you know, we don't have uh, the, the resources to investigate everyone, so at the end, it's, we just left it. But that's very distressing for a, for a French police officer. Someone in France was trying to sell an AK-47. It's either because the, the, the AK-47 will be used in somewhere in the suburbs of Marseille to kill a 17-year-old in a case of drug trafficking, or in the street of Paris to kill 150 people in a terrorist attack. So that's really distressing, because as an investigator, you know for sure that they will be linked to other investigation in that case, or you just drop the case. Um, next slide, please. That's another case that the French police gave me in 2016. Um, child abuse material being stored on the cloud storage service, reported, investigator go and see the, 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 the cloud storage services, they get the uh, log of IP, the, the IP logs, they get an IP, a timestamp, but no source port. So they go back to the uh, internet access providers, and the internet access provider provide a list of 50 individuals using the same IP connecting to the same platform at the same time. In that case, we investigate ev everyone. So which means that we have to invade the privacy of 49 potential um, innocent people to find one. Because in a case like this, it's child abuse material, very important, top priority, you invade everyone. So from a privacy perspective, it's also really bad. Next slide, please. I conclude on this one. Negative impact of CGN on security and online accountability for everyone. There's no online accountability. We do have massive, massive problem to investigate criminal um, activities. It's hindering every types of criminal um, activities from CSC, child sexual abuse, to terrorism, fraud, murder, cybercrime, everything. And it also impacts the privacy of individual because it pushes the law enforcement authorities to revert to very privacy invasive techniques in order to find out who's behind um, an address. So that's just the um, concrete example I wanted to give you about the negative impact of CGN. Thank you. Cheers, Craig. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Craig. I'm not sure that we're going to try and leave a good 30 minutes for questions at the end of the panel. So unless, sir, if you've got a question now, certainly. Hi, my name is Jens Kessner. I'm here for the uh, Swiss Telecoms Regulator. And uh, as you mentioned the Swiss case, I would just quickly try to reiterate. I don't know the case uh, itself. Just to, to be clear, had the French police provided the source port? Okay. Is there a quick question, sir? Because gone. Okay. Um, and just um, IP6 has been on as a standard for over um, 70 years now. And um, given all these problems, um, and the internet is not a public utility, 
it isn't time for the government to come in and say that, you know, and mandate, you know, telcos to, yeah, use, use policy question because of this scale of problems to say it's time to implement IP6. I think, it, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I'm going to know that and we'll come back to that at the end because I'm sure there's a lot of questions similar to that would take a bit of a, um, a response. So I think we just will carry on. And I've, Ronnie to my right here is a cybersecurity expert who works for Proximus, which is pretty good because that's my provider back home and I'll be speaking to him to later about some buffering issues I have. <laughs> <laughs> so don't go. Um, so, and he's the... Um, the Proximus liaison for the uh, sea certs and law enforcement in, in, um, in Belgium. On you go, Ronnie. Um, just waiting to get the slides up. Is this the one? That's the one, yep. And you can go on further. So I've been bold enough to put my contact details on <laughs> here. So if you want to <laughs> rant uh, <laughs> after uh, this panel, you know how to find me. Next slide. So we, we've been discussing here it, that CGN is a bad thing, but actually we came to the conclusion that we needed CGN. Why? In 2012, our local RER ran out of IPv4 space. So while we still saw a relatively slow adoption of V6, uh, Jan has told that if you implement V6, 50% of your traffic will shift to V6, which is true, but that means uh, only the big content providers have actually adopted V6. It's a very small hat and a very long tail problem. So can we abolish IPv4 very quickly as an access provider? We can't. While we indeed saw the growth of always on sessions, we quickly had more always on sessions for both our fixed line and mobile device and that surpassed largely the amount of IPv4 that we had available. So the first thing we did was blindly adopt CGN with all of its problems and then we backed out. So next slide. So yes we needed CGN but on one end on the other hand, we also have some social responsibility as an operator. We do not voluntarily want to box in the customer and give them a broken internet. So I think as, a, as an operator, we still want to give the customer full and correctly working internet access. And through CGN, you will not achieve it. But we also have a social responsibility towards society and we need to support our law enforcement agencies to be able to identify uh, misbehaving persons, if it's on cyber crime or in real world crime, we need to be able to support uh, their identification needs. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 2012, we were actually approached by our regulator, the BIPT, and the Federal Computer Crime Unit through our Internet S Service Provider Association to say, hey, guys, you started implementing CGN, we asked for an identification, and now you give us 1,000 IPs. So we cannot do our job anymore. Can we come to some uh, common understanding to solve this problem? So we engaged in a voluntary code of conduct where all of the uh, internet providers that signed it actually say that they will comply to, the, to restrict the usage of CGN. So only when your free IP space drops below the 20% threshold, you can implement CGN. I think most of the providers are currently in that situation, but it also limits the number of subscribers that we not behind a single identifier, a single IPv4 address to 16. So in the case that the law enforcement agency cannot provide the source port number, we give him 16 addresses. Is that ideal? No, but it's a lot better than invading the privacy of, uh, in the case of 1,000 addresses, invading the privacy of 900 and 900, uh, 999 innocent people. So it certainly increases the 
uh, likelihood of identification because in most cases the law enforcement agencies have more than one data point in time. So if you clutter that together, you're more likely to get the uh, single uh, misbehaving person out of it. And we also guarantee, obviously, that if they can provide the uh, source port, we can provide the unique subscriber. So we log the uh, port allocations per subscriber, not all of the connections, because that's also a trade-off between capacity and privacy. Um, but we log the block allocations, so if they can provide the source port, we can provide the unique um, subscriber. Next slide. Is all of that signing without effort? No. Uh, in order to actually keep up with the COC, with the code of conduct, we currently are always reshuffling our IPv4 pools to make optimal use of V4. But we're also ramping up our V6 uh, deployments. Because as Jan said, CGN has scaling issues. So the more subscribers we bring to V6, uh, the less investment we need to do. We are a commercial entity after all. So we are uh, currently for fixed line dual stacking all of our uh, modems. So by the end of next year, through phase out of older CPEs, all of our fixed line customers will have a V4 and a V6 address. Our CPEs for TV set of boxes will also be V6. So if you stream Netflix from on your TV, it will be using V6. And we're currently also doing a study for the next generation network to see how we can actually converge to V6 only and do less four to four now. For the mobiles, we, that's where we adopted the, uh, the CGN first with a little bit lagging uh, behind. So they're predominantly behind CGN. And in 2018, we will also double stack them. So all of our mobile subscribers will also be V6 enabled. And also as a content provider or as a corporation, we are trying to increase the number of source ports that we log or the number of applications where we we'll actually log the source port. So if somebody, if we are attacked, we can approach the LIA and provide the source port and they can do unique identification. Next slide. But one point I wanted to stress here is that it's not only regulating the access provider, because CGN and IPv6 deployment or adoption is not only an access provider problem. Um, the, our code of conduct kind of reduces the CGN impact, it smoothens it out while we do the increased transition to V6. But on the other end, there's a lot of other players to get to full V6 adoption. You have all of the content providers. You also have the government part. Um, currently still, if the government requests a new tender, it's not mandatory to be V6 enabled. Yes, V6 capable is in the tender, but even if they deploy new infrastructure, it's not V6 enabled. So there is no traction on the content side actually to move over to, v or not enough traction to move over to V6. And I think we're in the boat together. Um, only when content traction to V6 increases, the internet service providers will follow suit. Thanks very much, Ronnie. And now we're going to go to uh, Paul Wilson, who's the CEO of APNIC. Paul. Hi. Uh, my s good. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> my uh, my honour to and embarrassment actually to be here to uh, be the last speaker and to complete this uh, all male panel. Second last. I'm sorry. You're the last man on the panel. Okay, uh, I've got uh, some slides coming up off a USB stick uh, at the moment. Um, I'm Paul, Paul Wilson from, uh, from APNIC, which is the IP address registry for Asia Pacific. So we spend our time uh, managing, uh, allocating and registering IP addresses and, um, and related uh, numeric uh, internet resources for ISPs in the Asia Pacific. Uh, we're one of five, so there are four other uh, regional internet registries around the world who, uh, who also share this task. Can you just do that? 
actually is. It actually is. I might be too big. I might be too big. Look, I, I do have some uh, some slides with some graphics I'd like to show, so I might hand over to the second last member of the panel and um, and follow afterwards when we while we sort out this um, technical problem. Thanks. No problems. It is live, so these things do happen. So now over. To are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> so we now have uh, Daniel, who's the CEO of the National Communications Secretariat of Kenya. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Um, actually, I was told I was going to be the last speaker, so oh, yes. I was just going to say that I agree with uh, what my colleagues up here have said, especially <laughs> <laughs> on the issues of, uh, uh, you know, the problems uh, from what Jan said, what Ron said, and what Greg said. But uh, uh, let me just say that I'm really grateful to be on this panel. Mm -hmm. As you may have noticed, everybody else who has spoken was going to speak is actually an expert. I'm the only guy here from government, and until five days ago, I didn't know what CGN meant. <laughs> so I was volunteered for this panel. So uh, it, it's okay, don't worry. So it means I can, I'm the only person who can probably talk from his heart and say uh, dumb things which perhaps will uh, try and bring a perspective, a different perspective other than from the experts in this field. Um, you know, in IGF we talk about multi-stakeholder engagement. When I look at this table here, according to the Constitution of Kenya, we are not compliant because we are supposed to uh, make sure we have a 30% gender, gender parity and we don't have that. I'm the only person from government, so we are really don't have everybody represented at the table, but maybe this is for next year when we have a similar uh, uh, discussion, we should be more, uh, I think, inclusive. What I gather we are trying to say is, uh, how do you encourage the deployment of IPV version 6 so that we, we run away from the, pro the potential problems that uh, uh, nothing uh, is presenting to us? And um, my comments will dwell on what I know, uh, what we've done in Kenya to try and encourage the deployment of IPV version 6. So that will be the, 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 the main uh, uh, you know, uh, thrust of my contribution. In 2009, actually, what we did, we are required by the Constitution always to involve everybody. So we really practice multi-stakeholderism or whatever uh, the, the word is. So we had a national task force uh, deploy for the deployment of IPP version 6. Uh, the government, the regulator, industry, civil society, and academia. And the idea was to try and put together forward um, a strategy that would uh, adopt long term over the, um, of how to deploy this. You also notice I'm the only person without uh, slides. Because I was being the last person and I was just going to talk for one minute or so. This task force uh, actually ended up recommending that we have a test bed, which was provided by AFRINIC, our regional registry, and it was deployed at our national um, you know, uh, registry, it's called KENIC, and uh, some training was undertaken uh, on, on, on the technical aspects. Later on, that test bed was moved to the national uh, internet exchange point so that it could have a, more, more people could have access to it. And I'm um, informed that uh, the African Union Commission is actually upgrading that, uh, that equipment so that uh, the capacity is increased. So we, we, we are at that stage where we are trying to, to bring up the deployment of version 6. Um, what we've done as the government of Kenya also that in uh, reviewing our national ICT policy, we put a specific po provision that the government will encourage and support the deployment of uh, IP version 6. And we put there something which is not exactly mandatory, but says that all new government purchases, uh, ICT equipment purchase, should be ICT version 6 capable. So that's at a high level. That's what we're trying to do as, uh, as, you know, as a government. Now, of course, the test in the pudding will be how to actually implement that in terms of um, uh, implementation or uh, the, the people who purchase the equipment, the people who procure the equipment. So th that's what we've done. Uh, in Kenya, like in many developing countries, 99.99% of our internet uh, access is through mobile devices. And uh, about 80% of that market is actually dominated by one player. And we have three mobile operators. So I believe that those three 
uh, operators plus people provide them with backbone are important stakeholders to have in the discussion about this deployment. And as we've seen from other uh, countries, that is a, uh, GSM operators are the largest uh, users of, uh, of CGN. So um, I, I get a feeling, or I could be wrong, that uh, the technical people are talking to themselves too much and they are not expanding that sphere to include the people who actually are supposed to, to effect these changes. Um, I am advised the government on policy and I'm telling you until last week I didn't know what CGN is, which means the discussion has been taking place for 10 years, but obviously either myself or people like me who are not considered relevant or who are not found to be you know, worthy of uh, participating in the discussion. So what am I saying? I think this, this issue of CGN and deployment of IPv version 6 should not be a technically driven or market driven, but maybe should be policy or a combination of all that so that everybody's on the same page on what we need to do. On the issue of um, uh, law enforcement, uh, in, in our country, Kenya, where we face a lot of uh, challenges in terms of uh, you know, crime and also terrorism, I think if we bring in law enforcement in this discussion about the, 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 the shortcomings of CGN, it's possible that you'll see a lot more being done. But uh, so that, that is something that I would like to, 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 you know, to ask that we include everybody in the, in the discussion. So, uh, uh, I'm about to conclude, Chairman. Uh, I think that this should be a policy-driven, and the area that I'm familiar with, which I'll use as an example, and some people have had this before, we, we did a migration from analog to digital TV. Initially, it was being done as a technical process, but actually when we took it as a policy-driven process where we're looking at new content, new broadcasters, access to information, we're actually able to do the migration very well and we were, Kenya was one of the few countries that actually managed to migrate from analog to digital TV within the stipulated time. So uh, my point is that uh, a policy-driven process is more inclusive and can actually get us more results in uh, solving the, the problem that we have. The other question is, um, is why is CGN so, so popular? Uh, this is just a question. What, is, what problem is it solving that the other uh, I mean, the IP version this cannot solve. So if we can answer that question, perhaps uh, we'll find out why, why this is, uh, you know, is, is there. Perhaps it's the issue of content. If only 50% of the content can be translated to IP version 6, what happens to the other 50%? And with the localization of content, perhaps you are going to leave out the local or the, 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 the national uh, content providers who may still be running on the, on the, in the old uh, protocol. So I, I, I think that uh, the, the, the proposals that were made forward of double stacking and, uh, and um, uh, you know, looking for other solutions as we promote as, uh, version six is, is really um, uh, important. So other than that, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me and uh, I hope that I can answer any questions that uh, connect to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, just one comment. We, we have tried very hard to get the, the, um, the agenda and the diversity balance of this panel, but the uh, time of year is not particularly great for any of us. And um, anyway, I wanted to say no more about that. Paul, are you ready now? I think um, uh, CGNs have been sufficiently defamed by now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think they're, they're possibly still being accepted as a, as a necessary evil. And I want to say a few words which are um, uh, not about CGNs, but about the motivations for CGNs and the exit strategy, which uh, is IPv6. Um, because that exit strategy actually is now available and it is now being taken. And it's really worth us all understanding exactly where we are with IPv6 because things are changing uh, very rapidly and have changed um, very rapidly just in recent, the last couple of years. So, I mean, as, as we've heard, IPv6 is the exit strategy. It's got a huge amount of address space. The only reason to deploy CGNs is, in fact, if you're not using IPv6 or if you're still trying to use IPv4 and to share, to share IPv4 addresses. So IPv6 is the, is the answer. It's been available for um, many years, actually, for well over 10 years. And um, it was to the disappointment of many that somehow it wasn't just automatically deployed uh, many years ago as, as it was assumed. But you've got to think back 
in my opinion, to the dot-com boom times when you didn't really need to, to do very much to justify spending a lot of money on the internet. That changed in the early 2000s. The internet became a much leaner and meaner and much more highly competitive uh, industry. And uh, the costs of, of deploying IPv6 just didn't stack up and haven't stacked up against the, the other uses of, of funds that could be invested in, in competitive advantage. Uh, because as, as we all probably know, the IPv6 has been the, its, its own enemy in terms of actually not delivering something that the end users, users want. We've been looking out for the killer application, the theoretical killer application for IPv6 for many, many years. Uh, but in fact, there isn't one. The, the killer application uh, is, the, is the internet itself. Uh, but only when, uh, when it's necessary to move through uh, the transition, uh, through the, the, the lack of IPv4. So we can see uh, on the next slide uh, what that looks like in terms of the IPv4 pools that are available at each of the five RARs. And they really have crashed down. They're hitting, uh, they, they've hit rock, rock bottom in, uh, in at least one RAR. But the, all four of the, the four others are now in a sort of rationing phase where only very small allocations of V4 are, are available. That's been done deliberately because V4 is still, some access to some V4 addresses is still necessary for the use of CGNs uh, in future uh, for anyone who actually needs it. If you didn't have that rationed uh, space available to you, you'd, you'd, really be, you'd really be stuck. It wouldn't be even a question of using CGNs. Point is, uh, 20 million or so addresses available. It's only now with that shortage that uh, mines have been sharpened and the real, the real need for IPv6 has, um, has actually come about, um, which is the, the lack of V4 addresses. So the next, the next slide shows what has changed. Um, the, blue, the blue line is the uh, world uh, end user capability of, uh, for use of IPv6. It's, uh, this is a, a graph that's based on collection of about 12 million measurements a day that come into, come into APNIC and tell us uh, not only uh, that IPv6 is being used, but quite a few other, um, quite a few other measures as well. So the world, uh, the world adoption is about 15% at the moment. That is getting close to a billion people using IPv6 today. Uh, the second line, uh, the red line actually um, sort of debunks a, a misconception about, about Asia, um, such that that has existed, uh, that Asia has somehow been ahead of the game. And that it certainly was ahead of the game in foreseeing, foreseeing the need, but, but did, uh, has not uh, performed until very recent years uh, any actual deployment of, of great significance. But you can see that the, that the Asia curve there is, uh, is rising very rapidly in the Asian um, uh, deployment of V6 will, in percentage terms, will, will exceed the rest of the world very, very soon. Now, the, the next chart drills down a little more, uh, looking at, uh, on average, on a country basis, which are the countries with the highest deployment percentage-wise of V6. So, these days it starts with uh, Belgium. Belgium, it's 58%, followed by, and this has changed very recently, India at 51%. So, India percentage-wise is the second uh, country in terms of av average V6 uh, usage in the world. It's by far the largest in terms of the number of users because 51% uh, of uh, Indian internet users is, uh, is uh, some hundreds of millions of, of <coughs> internet users using IPv6. The list goes on. I won't, I won't go into it. You'd, you'd, you'd expect, as expected, you'd see quite a few developed internet markets on this list, but you also see a few developing markets. And that's, that's very interesting from the point of view, again, of assumptions that people make about where IPv6 is going to be deployed. So let's look at uh, India next. India now has a, a national uh, deployment average of, of over 50%. That's almost uh, entirely due to a company called Reliance Geo that, um, that mucked up the market by offering free uh, mobile wireless data services to anyone who needed it and, si and consequently signed up, as I said, hundreds of millions of, of, uh, of Indian internet users to, a, to an internet service that is an IPv6 uh, service. Hence, uh, their own internal uh, use of IPv6 is over 90% of those users are, are on IPv6. People with older phones or other, other issues are less than 10%. Um, they'd, be, they'd be continuing to use V4 through carrier grade uh, NAT. I think, as um, Jan said before, the, the point of uh, having a mixed, uh, a, a dual stack network and still having carrier grade NAT is that 
the NAT is only used in the case of, of IPv4 connections. Therefore, here is reliance with, it, with less than 10% of their users having to rely on a carry-grade NAT, and that puts, that puts them in a, in a great advantage uh, compared with others. The interesting thing here that I, I, I don't have on the chart, but, is, but it, it is that there are two other mobile providers in India who have, who have quickly followed, and they're, they're quickly developing up to 20% uh, or so capability at the moment. So that's a very good example of, uh, of a, a, leader, a competitive situation with a leader um, moving first. So quickly uh, through to the next slide, the United States, as we expect, it's had a, it's had a very slow, steady um, growth of IPv6 with quite a number of providers uh, proving that it can be used again over, the, over these recent years in a, in a production, reliable internet uh, industry manner. Um, next, uh, Japan uh, is also moving steadily up over, the, over a few years, but there have been some other more rapid movers as well, which, as, as I say, is something to be, to be aware of in recent years. Next one is, is Vietnam. Uh, again, as I say, not, not an economy where people would necessarily expect uh, IPv6 to be used, but uh, there's a Vietnamese service provider which is not a mobile provider, it's a cable provider, and it's providing V6 residential services, and that's contributed to Vietnam's you know, being, being quite high up on the list as well. And just finally, to show how quickly this can move, uh, Uruguay's Antel just deployed uh, V6 within the last six months, and they've risen up to 50% of the, of the country's V6, close to 50% of the country's uh, uh, internet users being V6 capable. Uh, this is all on the provider side. We know that there's a sort of chicken and egg situation. There's no point in providing IPv6 V6 services un unless you can access IPv6 content. Uh, the next slide just shows uh, Google's latest, which is that their content, their, their services are now delivering 20% of their content through IPv6, and that's a huge volume of content. Uh, the next one, uh, Facebook has hit 50% in the USA. Now, the, the last couple of slides uh, are an attempt to answer the question of how long this is going to, going to take, uh, because no one can really predict the future. A lot of these things come out of the blue as, uh, as companies with probably quite confidential business plans sort of come out into the open and implement their services. So at APNIC, we took a look at technology ad adoption against something called the sigmoid curve, which is, a, which is a mathematical formula which looks at how deployment in this kind of environment works. All of these things over history roughly um, follow some <laughs> kind of sigmoid curve, which is a, a slow start, a period of expansion, then a, then a long tail. And if we take uh, on the next slide our, um, our current early phase of IPv6 adoption as we see it, we see that we're sort of at, at that early point in the sigmoid curve, but we're really, if we, if we follow this curve, we're in, into a four or five year period of really rapid growth and followed by possibly a five to ten year long tail in which IPv4 will still exist on the internet, uh, but it will be predominantly IPv6. So this curve is why I, I try to tell people that there is still, after 15 years, there's still an early adopter advantage for IPv6 because you actually can, uh, as, a, as a user or a content, a content consumer or provider, you can uh, move to IPv6 and take uh, really concrete advantages now because you're either delivering your content to a user base of at least 20% uh, IPv6 users, or otherwise, as a user, you're you're able to access uh, a large volume of content uh, which is available on on IPv6. So it's it's something that's really worth uh, knowing about. It's something that has absolutely changed in the last couple of years and is going to uh, going to obvi obviously continue to grow. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. Thank you. Now we have the 25 minutes left for um, Q and A's, and um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the floor. But I think the first one is if we want to answer this gentleman's question regarding. Can I add to question? Certainly. Uh, another question, please. Yeah, just add. So, um, actually, my first question was rather um, rush. It, it was a rush, you know. Um, some, you know, it, it's not really. Um, um, smart to ask the government to like clamp down and say that people should um, kind of, you know, by force, by, by fiat. So I, I think the right question should be, um, what kind of po policy incentives, right, can government give to um, the small content um, producers that have the um, bigger problems in, you know, assessing IP6 expertise 
you know, and um, funding, right, to, 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 to get the, the um, process in place. So what kind of um, policy incentives, tax, tax rebates, that, 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 so I think that's a problem now. So Google, Facebook, they had resources to kind of implement this, um, I but the, the small content, like you said, um, big, big, big tail and long, um, big, big, big and long tail. So, so what kind of policy incentives can maybe the um, APNIC, um, the internet society, and even private companies can, can advise governments to give to ease the transition process? It's over 20 years now that IPC I, I, I was first um, um, as a standard. So that's a long time. So I think something needs to be done fast. Thank you. Yeah. Who would like to? Um, yeah, Jan. Okay, so I don't think the, the policy can solve this problem. We have a really good example in Belgium. So there are reasons why Belgium traffic to Google coming from Belgium is 50% on IPv6. They are, they are, Belgium is the world champion on IPv6 on implementation to the, to the end eyeballs on, I, on IPv6. And I was always wondering why. And now I, I have the answer when, when, when I talked with, with Gregory uh, from Europol, we figured out, yes, the operators from Belgium went into this voluntary agreement with the law enforcement that they will not put more than eight or something, 16, 16, 16 but now they are putting eight, technically they're putting basically eight uh, users behind one IP address to limit the, the number of people they have to investigate if the crime uh, happens. And all of a sudden the operators realized, oh, the CGN is not as useful as it was before because you know, now we use much more IP addresses to serve our customers. So what is, what is the, the way forward? And they figured out that IPv6 is solving lots of their, their issues and they just started deploying IPv6. And nowadays 50% of, of Belgian traffic to Google is IPv6. And I think these are the kinds of incentives that will move the operators in a natural way into, into deploying things that cost less, are end-to-end, -end, and um, uh, save them from, from non-scalability and the cost of, of a CGN. If we put in the policy saying everybody must deploy IPv6, then, you know, this is a repressive mechanism. People, people should, you know, deploying IPv6 is not, is not a, a, a business upgrade. It's a technology upgrade. It's a technology refresh. Operator should um, offer the connectivity for the user to the internet where you have IPv4 and IPv6. So why? Why should the operator give the access just to the half of the internet? It's the duty of the operator to give access over all used protocols to the internet. And I think this is a good incentive. Thank you. To, to, uh, to add to that, it, it, it's not only a technology upgrade. It's not only an access medium upgrade. If an, an operator wants to implement IPv6, there is a lot more to be done than upgrading the technology of the network. So the technology of the network is actually the easy thing. There is a lot of backend systems that need to be adapted. But to, to, to add to the answer to the question, I think, uh, and that's, that's more of a personal opinion, um, a lot of the reasons why IPv6 adoption is not ramping up on the within the smaller organizations is still awareness and scare. I think we're still failing to educate people on how v6 works. Um, if I look at traditional IT within our organization and you talk to the networking people there, they're not very well v6 aware. So that's something where governmental support yeah. uh, could help. I just want to help answer the question that he had raised on uh, incentives that have been given. In the AFRINIC region, in the African region, AFRINIC, 
actually has been giving away free IPv6 blocks yeah. with uh, every application of IP IPv4 address space for the last 10 years or so. Yeah. The challenge yeah. is that not everyone who re receives is deploying the V6. And there's also been training happening and uh, the training has been targeting largely the technical teams. Yeah. And, and I think in Kenya, we were able to get Afrinic to run a training with us for managers. And that helped substantially in getting more of the network operators now begin to uh, deploy uh, V6, though it's still not at the level where we should be. But the, 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 oper the managers who attended the training sessions were able to appreciate the need for IPv6. So yes, there has been capacity building, but it has been targeting only the technical staff and not the management and the decision makers of the companies that need to uh, make a decision to now deploy V6. Thank you, Fiona. Ron, I think you wanted to. Yes, thanks. Quick, uh, quick com comment on, uh, on both your questions. I know you, you've updated it, but to go back to your first question on should there be some governmental top-down mandate um, and I, I would just raise a couple of concerns on that. One is, uh, you know, operators are often trying to address their business needs of scale, uh, maybe security, maybe, uh, you know, there are other things they need to do moving some of their services to the cloud. These all are resource intensive uh, initiatives. And if, and if a mandate comes in that says, uh, everything must be running V6 by X date, uh, then there's, you know, business implications to that. And, and, uh, and then there's a jurisdiction question. There are many operators who are operating in multiple countries, so you know, then who's gonna provide that mandate? And is it a fractured mandate then if you know, they are, they're required in one part of their infrastructure but not in another? And a lot of these infrastructures are meshed. You know, the connectivity across their, their enterprise doesn't follow the, the geography underneath per se or necessarily the jurisdiction boundaries. So there's some complexity making that type of a top-down uh, edict and, and I appreciate the revised question of are, what kind of incentives could we create? And I, the one that comes to mind to me is, okay, there is a cost, there is an operator cost to enable it. Perhaps, you know, I've seen this in the US where there have been incentives on R&D credits. Maybe there's a V6 credit and this, you know, you get incentives through through tax and, you know, tax breaks or, or give an operator the opportunity to, you know, take the cost of uh, implementing it with a certain timeline and get some, you know, some, some positive benefit in that regard. That might be a great way to do it. Um, I've got about eight people on the list of questions, so if you ask a question, you can just be really short and blunt and we'll answer it very quickly. So the first one on my list is the gentleman over there. Thank you, Sebastian Vacholet. Uh, I am end user and I tried to follow your uh, presentation. Uh, it was quite interesting and I hope that I understood. First of all, Ron, thank you for putting at least one image of one user in his house. Uh, maybe next time you can do the same with IPv6 because I have the impression that the image you gave was uh, IPv4. And, and my question is the following. We try to have the government saying that uh, everybody needs IPv6. We try with uh, ISP, we try with, but why we don't try with end user? Maybe it's time to say in one year, we end user will be on strike for IPv4 and we need to, everybody to be on IPv6. If we start from us, we will not be able to be any more customer if we don't have uh, not IPv4, uh, IPv6. Thank you. The challenge with that is um, we are in uh, an ecosphere here, in particular around internet governance where perhaps we know a little bit about internet. The majority of the population just trust their internet is working. They have no idea what an internet address is. So to try to get seven billion people to rally around the idea of we must have IPv6 is quite a challenge. The gentleman here in the front. Thank you, um, Jens Kessner from uh, Ofcom Switzerland. Um, I've for a long time avoided uh, listening about listening to IPv6 discussions in the last years. This is the first time that I've heard from two of, of the panelists that there was an economic uh, business case for IPv6 implementation. Maybe um, the, the, the people from ISOC and, and, and uh, Proximus. Um, so is there really one for 
um, a multitude of, of operators? And if so, who spreads the word? Because I would, I would suppose operators need to know because the, the common um, conception is too expensive and unless everybody else does this, we won't do this first. We're not going to be the, the, the stupid um, people investing too much. Yeah, most operators have indeed adopted CGN, but since that's a, a stateful core and most of the implementations, if you do not for four, are stateful in the core, which means I need to get all of my traffic through one choke point and make sure it comes back. And then I need to scale this out to support the ever-growing always-on session needs. That's just technically very difficult to do, and you keep on adding boxes to that. If you transition your users to v6 you keep you don't need to add as many boxes which directly relate to money to to the problem so i think most operators should should have v6 knowledge by now um, because there has been a lot of capability building in the operator community so i think gradually and that's also probably one of the reasons why you see the v6 adoption rates uh, capability rates actually increasing in a multitude of countries is because people have deployed historically CGN and are now facing scaling issues with CGN, so ramping to V6 as a natural evolution. If I may just add, it's very simple. If you need to, if you want to translate 100 terabits uh, of traffic, you need to invest 1 million euros. If you want to translate half half of that you need to invest half a million euros is there an incentive i think there is uh, backends are one-time uh, investment cgn is ongoing and growing investment or cost. yeah but still how high was proximus one times in uh, investment that's something that isps would like to would need and like to know because as far as I perceive it in Europe, they're not motivated because of the money. Okay, we'll, we can say that afterwards because I'm just conscious of the time. I've got another five questions. I don't mind standing here then after the time this room's empty because I don't have lunch. I think <laughs> we're going to have to close this for other ones because at the moment I've got this gentleman here next, then Alan, then Dimitri, then Oscar, then Paul. So quick questions and we'll try and answer. We can't answer them now, we will answer them whilst we're sat here in the break. So. Uh, yes, hello, my name is uh, Ragnar Finsen, coming from an operator in Norway. Uh, we have not done V6 yet. We, we are very, very clear for doing it. However, um, one point is that uh, Ron, uh, sorry, Gregory, uh, you mentioned that you had some problems with solving cases where you uh, were in meeting NAT uh, problems. Uh, if those customers or perpetrators would have V6, would you, st would you be able to solve that case then? Because my, my in, uh, incentive for that question is, we have talked a lot about operators here. We've talked about a lot about ISPs, doing CG NAT, doing everything, but we've talked very little about content providers. And f typically, the, the, the sales <coughs> systems and all those guys, Facebook and Google, sure, they've done it. But in my country, we have about 40 to 60, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the website still being on V4, uh, comparing to the likes of 500, top 500 websites. So, sure, it's, it's, it's an important issue that we need to uh, target as well, not just the operators, uh, the internet operators, but also the content providers. So, thank you. Well, in short, I think we need to be modest in our approval. I don't know if we can solve the case with IPv6 systematically, but at least the internet access providers will, able, will be able to give us one subscriber connected to one IPv6. Of course, within a household or within a small SME, then it might be several persons behind one IPv6. But at the end, uh, you use normal uh, investigation techniques to find who that is. 
but you don't come with a list of 2,000 people. Just a quick comment. Sure, as long as the website is V6 enabled. So if it's not the V6 enabled, you're just as far. Thank you. If it's not V6 enabled and the majority of your traffic and subscribers for the majority of their time go over V6, you can as an operator more easily adopt the same method as we did, limiting the amount of subscribers you're not behind an IP address. So currently, if you're only adopting V4 nothing, then it's, it, it's a power by of the numbers problem. You need to do 1,000, 10,000 people behind an IP. Uh, if you do the combination of both techniques, you can come to a workable scenario for the law enforcement agencies. Listen, we've got five minutes. So, Alan. Hmm. Uh, hello, this is Alan Barrett from AfriNIC. Um, I'd like to respond to something Fiona said a little earlier about um, AfriNIC automatically giving IPv6 blocks when people receive IPv4 blocks. Um, we, we've never done that. You have to request the IPv6 block, and then you'll get it, of course. But it's not automatic if you don't request it. Thanks. Thank you. Dimitri? Thank you, Dmitry Burkov. Uh, I heard a lot of mantras. M mantras again on the IPv6. But as I remember, our theme was uh, how to solve the law enforcement problem. And uh, it's just the tools. It's just the tools how to solve. And for me, it's a question, even for example, it's an optimistic way. In 20 years later, we will get some IPv6 capabilities on it. Doesn't mean the traffic IPv6. But we will really solve the problem, or we will get new one. Because the network now is not neutral, the reality. We move to mobile networks, which is absolutely different architecture. And we have behind it a, service, a lot of service management and a lot of DPI, you can name it, it depends on tasks. Maybe we try to solve the wrong problem and by wrong tools. What do you think about this? And because also to me, for me it looks the key problem for law enforcement will be transborder cooperation. Yes, you try to, even inside Europe you still can solve this problem. And what's about reality? What's the real demand? Because all this I saw mantra about IPv6 and some uh, funds from fun club of IPv6. Sorry, I don't believe. The same, what's, uh, this presentation in different form, I see it's about 10 years ago. It was expected that this year we will have a domination of IPv6. Whereas we shifted for 10 years late. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. We won't respond to that. Oscar, then well, I'm going to have to close the list just to allow some of the guys up here to um, finish off. Oscar. Thank you. Uh, I'm Oscar Robles from LACNIC. Um, I want to comment on the role of the government and uh, I agree with Ronda Silva uh, about the complexities of uh, top-down um, policies uh, for the uh, country. But uh, there's something that governments can do as the main buyer of technology in the countries, uh, and that is uh, walking the, the talk to uh, start uh, asking for IPv6 uh, um, compatibility in their, their own services, uh, the, their, their own solutions that they are requiring that would uh, move the needle enough in the countries uh, for the providers to, to make it a, a business case. And the other uh, thing that they can do is, uh, in some uh, instances, to ban the entry of old equipment not compatible with IPv6, because that, that is also a risk to, co to uh, convert, to become a dump country with the old technology, uh, like uh, old um, uh, modems not supporting IPv6, uh, and uh, that's something that uh, some countries can do as well. Okay, so no more questions. I'm just going to leave it to Paul to say 30 seconds, then I'm going to leave the last comment to Daniel here to my left to, to wrap up the session. Paul. Thanks very much, uh, Dick. Uh, I was going to make the point about government procurement as a, as a very strong me uh, mechanism for, for industry development, for in inspiring some competitive um, development of capacity that governments, uh, that governments can, um, can, can require. Um, it's important to understand that V6 compatibility is not exactly a binary yes/no thing. There's a, there are a lot of potentially a lot of different aspects depending on what's being purchased. So, it would not be useful to have a, a tokenistic uh, IPv6 requirement. Uh, it requires some some check, some validation, some understanding, some some drilling down in order for that to happen. But it it is very powerful. 
The other, the other thing that is related is that, you know, governments are interested in IPv6 perhaps for industry development, but we should all be interested in IPv6 for the sake of the future of our own use of the internet, and all of us are users of internet products and services of many, many kinds. And any internet product and service actually has an IPv6 component to it potentially, and I would not be sort of investing in or trying to specify any product or, or service that you require at this stage uh, without asking about and informing yourself about how IPv6 is going to be supported. And that, that goes for web developers and consultants and advisors as, as much as it does for modems and, uh, and uh, you know, connectiv connectivity services. Thank you. Daniel, I hope your 30 yeah. seconds, it's going to be quicker 30 seconds than that, but it's down yes, to you. Uh, I'm the one who talks about our policy. Uh, our policy doesn't mandate. It says it will support and encourage. So it's not a mandatory requirement. So it's not in the law. It's just the policy. So this is in response to the, the, the comment from ICANN. And uh, my last comment is that I think ICANN, Internet Society, the regional registries have their work cut out. I think this discussion needs to go outside the technical community and involve everybody, including policy makers, decision makers, end users, so that uh, when the time, the crunch time comes, when we have to connect 20 billion or 30 billion people, we are connecting them using the, the, the correct protocol. So capacity building, I think it's good. Let's stop talking to uh, each other. Let's talk, include other uh, critical stakeholders in our discussions. Otherwise, it's been a pleasure to be on this panel. Thank you very much. We are here for the rest of the day, and I think most of us are here tomorrow as well. So if there's any other questions anyone want to ask us, we are about, and I'm sure we can get our email addresses out to the people who want to speak to us. So if you could everyone give the, the panel a big round of applause for the time and effort. And give yourself a round of applause for listening to all this, and then uh, thank you very much.